Today I'm going to explain what causes chronic back pain and sciatica. What is pain? I will prove to you that tissue damage like disc herniations, muscle tears, nerve irritation, and pelvic tilt, alignment, core stability, all, that, all the tissue stuff that we're obsessed about is not causing pain. I'll go so far as to argue that even if you had a broken arm, a broken arm does not in and of itself cause pain, you have to understand the neuroanatomy and the neuroscience in order to determine the cause of pain. And yes, I realize that sounds insane, but I'm going to back it up with research and neuroanatomy. You will understand this by the end of this series. So this is part of a big series on pain neuroscience. Today we're talking about normal pain processing, but then we'll go on to discuss the three types of pain, how chronic pain lives in the whole body, how the body can become sensitized and hypersensitive, how to fix that, and I'll probably add some more weird stuff on the end. But today we're talking about normal pain processing. You step on a nail, we have to send a signal to the brain. Along the way, it has to go through gates and roads to get to the brain. Gates are like synapses, roads are like neurons. We'll talk about how when you get to the brain, there is a neurosignature and an output of pain. I'll teach you why pain is not an input, pain is an output. And by the end of this series, you will understand pain science better than your doctor. First, I wanna dispel the idea that structure causes pain. This paper shows that 90 to 95% of low back pain does not have an identifiable structural cause. Even if you have a disc herniation, in most cases, not all, but most cases, the disc herniation is not the cause of your pain. I promise you will understand how that is absolutely undeniable by the end of this series. Okay, so if the pain isn't coming from tissue damage, then are you saying then it's just in my head? I wanna be really clear on this point. Pain is not in your head. But at the same time, pain is also not in your spine. Pain is what we call an emergent phenomenon. What does that mean? Well, a traffic jam is an example of an emergent phenomenon. Each individual car is following its own set of rules. It has to go the speed limit, slow down when the car in front of it slows down. It has to stay in its lane. So each individual car is actually trying its best not to cause traffic, and yet traffic happens. And sometimes it's inexplicable why traffic happens right here on this road, but then half a mile up the road, it's fine, even though there's no accident. And just to thoroughly get the structure idea out of your head, let's look at a study that looked at 3,000 people, a giant systematic review. And what they found was that at, by 50 years old, 80% of people will have disc degeneration, 60% will have a disc bulge, 36% will have a disc protrusion, 23% will have an annular fissure, and they found many other things as well. But my question for you is how many of these people do you think had pain? Most of them, half of them, all of them, none of them, what do you think? Well, put your answer in the comments, but the answer is, da 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 here we go, it's zero. None of them had pain, zero. And what this shows us is that the stuff on your MRI does not tell us anything about whether or not you will have pain. And you're like, okay, good, good for them, but you know, why do they get to be pain free, but I have pain? You know, it's it's not fair. You know, that that's bullshit. I don't care about them. I care about me right now having pain and not being able to live the life that I need to be living. I'll teach you exactly why you're in pain and what to do about it in this series. But first, who am I to even tell you this stuff in the first place? Well, first of all, I am Dr. Anthony Davis. I'm a doctor of chiropractic medicine. I'm a college anatomy and physiology instructor. I have my master's in exercise science. I'm a certified medical exercise specialist. I have over a thousand hours of yoga teacher training um, and 12 different specialist certifications in rehabilitation. More importantly, I know what it's like to deal with chronic pain. I had pain for over a decade, and this is a real picture of me passed out drunk at the bottom of a staircase because that was the only way that I could numb the pain. But I fixed it and became a doctor. And I was only able to do that because I got clarity on the real root cause of chronic pain. And the truth is there is no single cause. Pain is multifactorial. We need to zoom out rather than zooming in. We need to think systems instead of thinking one little tiny structure at a time. And since I figured that out for myself, I've also been able to help hundreds of people just like you to reclaim the active life they love. So what is pain? Again, today we're talking about normal pain processing. But if you have chronic pain, then your pain processing, the neurology of how your brain and nervous system process pain, 
is not normal, which means that when you have pain, it is not an indication of damage, meaning hurt does not equal harm. Now, most people think that pain happens like this. You damage a tissue, like you tear a muscle, for example, and therefore you have pain. But this is how pain is actually processed, and I have left a lot of information off of this illustration. You will understand this by the end of this series, but the short version is, yes, fine, we tear a muscle, we herniate a disc, something like that, but we have volume knobs in the spinal cord, in the periphery, in the brain. We can turn the volume up or down on the signal. Our immune system, our circulation, our digestive system, our sensory organs, our brain, our thoughts, our beliefs, all of these things are interacting. It's not even just uh, one causes the other causes the other. It's their back and forth. And ultimately, we have to determine if there is a threat. And if there is, we're going to have pain. And if there's not, we're not having pain. So in order to understand why things go wrong and why you have chronic pain, first you need to understand what happens when things go normally. Here's the broad picture and then I'll break it down. Basically, let's say you step on a nail. Well, you're gonna have to get that signal to the brain somehow and you do not have pain until the brain is consciously aware of that experience and then determines it's a threat and therefore creates pain. Along the way to the brain, there are several gates and roads that we need to cross Gates are like synapses and roads are like neurons. So let's start at the beginning. You step on a nail. So far, this person has no pain. When they step on the nail, it stimulates nerve receptors. These are called nociceptors. I wanna be clear, there is no such thing as a pain receptor in the body. Again, no such thing as a pain receptor in the body. What we have is nociceptors, and nociceptors are danger receptors or threat detectors, but ultimately they have to just tell the brain what they found, and the brain determines whether or not it is a threat, and then the brain generates pain. So you step on a nail, you stimulate a nociceptor, then we need to fire an electrical signal along that nerve to send the signal. When the receptors are stimulated by tissue damage, sodium will flood into the cell. I'm oversimplifying this. But essentially, sodium floods into the cell, and if enough of it floods in, then we're going to send an electrical signal. That's because sodium is positively charged. But if we don't get enough sodium crossing the membrane, then we do not send an electrical signal, and therefore, we do not have pain. So the receptors and synapses in our nerve cells are like gates. We need a certain amount of effort or a lock or a key uh, to open the gate. If we don't open the gate, we cannot continue on the road. And a gate could be really difficult to open, it could be heavily fortified, or it could be very easy and flimsy and you could just bust right open and then it's easy to deliver the message. We'll talk about how things go wrong in a future video. But assuming everything is normal, we stimulate the nociceptor, we open the gate, and now we fire an electrical signal, we travel along the road or the neuron. Road number one is called your primary afferent neuron or primary input neuron. Again, so far we have no pain. Then we get to the spinal cord where we have another gate. We have a synapse. And if we get through that gate, then we get another road or neuron up to the brain. Again, so far we have no pain. Once we get to the thalamus in the brain, we have another gate. Now in truth, we have a lot of gates here and they go to a lot of different places. But for simplicity, we have another gate and another road, and that goes up to the primary somatosensory cortex of the brain. So again, we started in the foot, stepped on a nail, went through a gate, traveled to the spinal cord, went through another gate, traveled to the brain, went through another gate, traveled to another region of the brain, but still, so far, we have no pain. This is where things get interesting. This study found a certain neurosignature of pain in the brain, and we found all of these different regions of the brain that light up in response to pain. And depending on how they interact, we may or may not have pain. But where it gets even more interesting is that pain doesn't happen until there is an output of the brain. Pain is not an input. The brain receives a lot of signals, but once the brain filters and processes and weighs and considers and judges those signals using this pain neuro signature, then it will either output, yes, there is a threat, yes, 
they, you're gonna have pain, or no, no threat, no pain. So at this point, now, maybe you have pain. So how is pain an output? Let's be really specific. Some of it is very obvious. For example, the primary motor cortex outputs overprotective muscle bracing and muscle spasms. This is a pain behavior in your muscular system. The prefrontal cortex is going to output cognitive modulation, change your thought process and conscious awareness. The anterior cingulate cortex is going to emotionally process the context of what's going on. The insula is going to be responsible for pain perception, emotional and autonomic responses. The putamen is responsible for physical responses to pain. Areas of the brainstem, as well as the periaqueductal gray area, famously, um, are going to inhibit or modulate the pain, meaning turn the volume knob down. And if these areas are not working properly or not stimulated, then you're going to have more pain. The hippocampus is going to bring in memory and context. Am I in a threatening situation or not? The amygdala is going to trigger the emotional fight or flight response, a stress response. So depending on this output, you will or will not have pain. Basically, these areas of the brain are processing the context and situation and sensory information to determine if there is a threat. And if there is a threat, then you will have pain. But if the brain determines, actually, no, I am safe, then you will not have pain. Does this make sense? We've got a lot to cover on how things can go wrong and how that can lead to chronic pain, even in the absence of tissue damage. But I want you to understand this stuff first. So please let me know in the comments, is this making sense? Is there anything that you want me to cover in more detail? Or is there anything that you're having some aha moments that, oh my God, it's like, okay, I think I'm seeing how this works. It's starting to click for me. Let's recap. You step on a nail, we have to trigger a sensory receptor, a nociceptor, which is like opening a gate. If we stimulate it enough with getting enough sodium rushing into the cell, then we trigger a action potential, which is an electrical signal, which is like traveling along a road or a neuron to the spinal cord, where we repeat the process with another gate and another road. We get to the brain, we've got another gate, another road. When we finally do get to the brain, this neurosignature will either indicate pain or not, depending on the context, situation, inputs, and then ultimately, if there's pain, it's going to be an output to the entire body. Now, to give you a teaser of where we're headed, if we close the gates, let's say we close one of the gates, keep it closed, well, then we're gonna have no pain. Ah, I bet you're interested, how do we do that? I'll talk about that in a later video. But the opposite of that is what's happening for most of you in chronic pain, which is where these gates are just open all the time, anybody can waltz through, the brain is getting bombarded with danger signals, so you have chronic pain. Even when this is not from a damage issue, and again, I wanna be really clear here, most of the time, even if you see a disc herniation on the MRI, for nine out of 10 of you, the pain that you're having is not a correlation with actual damage in the body. And that's because we can have tissue damage like a disc herniation. You see it on the MRI, it looks bad, but guess what? We could have the same exact disc herniation with pain or without pain. Or we could have a perfect looking spine, we could have no damage with or without pain. And that's because structural anatomy does not correlate with pain because pain is processed through thousands and thousands of inputs and your brain ultimately is going to either hit the alarm system or not. So next time we'll be talking about how there are only three different types of chronic pain. It really simplifies things and if you understand the types of pain, then we understand what to do about it. So be sure to watch that video next. As soon as it's published, it'll appear on your screen and I'll see you there.